So why, who says that novels are supposed to be about the psychological inner life of, our, of the character? Well. <laughs> I mean, I, I hear what you're saying because yeah. people are always praising the novelist for having such deep insight into the character or making them so believable or um, striking such a voice. But there is a whole world of novels of ideas which really aren't about that and there's no plot structure and, you know, there's structure of some other kind. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, I don't know what you think even about structure. How important structure is? I mean, how much do you sit down and labor over the structure of your book before you get started? Well, I, God, there's. I have like five follow-ups that I want to chase. <laughs> Just remember these thoughts. Yeah. Language. Uh, no, Somebody okay. write these down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> structure is a great question because I've always thought, and this is. An yeah, structure is really interesting. This is something that's come, come to, clarity for me in teaching, which is always where you learn what you didn't realize you'd come to understand about something is when you're asked to explain it to someone else. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a remark that I recall out of the world of, um, uh, you know, the, the milieu of uh, Hollywood producers who smoke big cigars and say cynical things about I the audience. Be smoking cigars. <laughs> yeah. And, and, it, and it sounds like one of those things that's, that a Hollywood producer says while smoking a big cigar and making cynical remarks about the audience. And the, the remark is, uh, if 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 the film has you know um, one good scene in it, mm -hmm. your audience will will be more or less satisfied. And if it has three good scenes in it, they'll recommend the the movie to someone else. And if it has five good scenes in it, really good scenes mm -hmm. where people are excited by what happens in that one scene, mm -hmm. they'll say they saw a great movie. And they have no regard for the overall structure. Mm -hmm. They're just basically enumerating. Uh, peak experiences, uh, epiphanies, set pieces that turn them on, that blow them away. Well, of course, this can be taken as a very, very cynical kind of quantification of the the le the, the minimum threshold for entertainment. Mm -hmm. But I saw it as a kind of um, epiphany for me about what I really cared about in the movies, but also the stories I read and the ones I wrote, which is that the strength of individual sequences and set pieces actually was for me the persuader. And I began to think more and more that uh, structure or... In what you wrote, you're saying. Even. In, in, yeah, in my own work. And, and that structure or plot, and plot's the word that fiction writers are mm -hmm. always throwing around without, I think, ever knowing exactly what they mean by it, mm -hmm. was a kind of chimera. That, in fact, the, the, the best stories were uh, accumulations of Really Marvelous scenes. sequences, mm -hmm. set pieces, moments, epiphanies that were totally persuasive mm -hmm. in and of themselves, and that uh, the tissue that connected them was merely tissue. It was, it was an excuse to get from one to the next, yeah. and that yeah. no one can actually think about the whole structure of a book very well. I have to agree with you so much so that I ended up using that as my structure, mm -hmm. because I labored on, uh, for a long time about what I was even doing and what I was writing, and eventually sat down to do storyboards. And, on, and I decided I would not have connectors. It would just be literally scenes. And this, each scene would be very short, and that's how the book is now structured. Each scene is very short, and then there's the next scene. And maybe the next scene is folded into the previous scene, but maybe it happened 10 years earlier, or it happened at some other time. There is no connecting tissue. And I found the connecting tissue such an artifice and so frustratingly false. Even though, you know, I was trying this fictionalized form, I didn't want to be false. And this is a bizarre notion. What does it mean? for my fiction to be true, right, for my made-up stuff to feel true, and what does it mean for the made-up stuff to feel false? And for some reason, that connecting tissue felt really false, and I just couldn't do it. And I, when I discovered that, that that's what I was doing, I suddenly was able to write the book. So in a sense, I'm agreeing with you, but I'm going to say at the same time, the fact that I discovered the structure made it possible for me to, mm -hmm. to finish something. Right. As opposed to only have, because I, all I did have was isolated scenes for a while, hanging around in, in no chronological order. Um, right. Well, the, what, what you're... What, what's very interesting about what you're saying is that it's a process of um, reduction. And this was something I noticed in your writing in both books that was so stirring to me. It, was it, it, it seemed as though you'd instinctively reached for um, what I sometimes want to call a homeopathic approach to, um, or, you know, <laughs> less is more. But, but that the, the giving the, the tiniest amount of structure or indication can be so overwhelmingly persuasive that it's by withholding the rest that you create the power. Mm -hmm. 
of your, your well, narrative. Painters talk about what's beyond the frame. Right. I mean, you talk about visual art analogies. That's what's so when you see good work, it doesn't, visual art paintings, let's just say two-dimensionally, they don't collapse inside the frame, mm -hmm. right? They're all, it's all structured so that there's a lot going on outside the frame, and, right. you, and so you as observer are asked to conjure up in your own imagination. You know, what's the f what's the fuller picture and that's what we do also I think that's why also I you know I love read I'm one of those readers who just really reads for just to be alive and mm -hmm. and and it's because it must stir the pleasure centers as you're imagining things I mean something really visceral is happening like tasting the soup you know something's happening internally to me as that goes on that even though film I, I like film I'm drawn to film but not in quite the most the mm. same powerful way and I think it's it's wow. really physiological this, you're you're almost anticipating a whole host of things I came here knowing I wanted to talk with you about <laughs> because I mean one of the first responses I had when we were offered that um, uh, direction of of you know well you were talking about truth and we were, it was suggested that maybe the question of truth was one that we should examine and I immediately thought I concern myself very, very infrequently with truth. I concern, I concern myself almost entirely with response. Mm -hmm. oh, that's with interesting. With the mm -hmm. uh, material, material um, experience of um, epiphany or insight, not with uh, some factual um, absolute. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you talk about this, this version of your reading experience where you just seek uh, yeah. that... that that kind of thing. It also makes me think about another version of what we're talking about is another remark, another remark, another piece of advice. Oh, I can't remember who gave it. We can Google right. later and find out. It was a piece of writing advice, which was skip all the parts. Don't write all the parts that you skip as a reader. <laughs> which also... <laughs> That's interesting. It, it, it uh, brings me full circle to one of the other things that we were glancing off, which is um, this question of visualization and you say you don't like film or you don't respond to film in the same way. I do like film but you don't, you it's don't not quite as strong. Um, well, but yeah, that's because I'm not drawn you, to it as you're not, well, you, well that's, that word is precisely right. You're not drawn to it as much. Film offers too much. Mm -hmm. It's too complete. Mm -hmm. By using the, um, the tools of sound and visual recording uh, you're not activated right, exactly. to create it in collusion with the text. Shamefully, film is what I do when I'm really tired. Right. Reading right. is what I do when I'm, you know, it, I'm up for it. It takes <laughs> much less. It, it, it gives itself to you completely. I thought I'd be really excited about visual adaptations of things. You know, the idea of being involved in making a film, I'd be really excited about that side of it. Yeah. More than I would be about watching it. Well, um, this privacy, this essential transaction that goes on when a reader is reading a book that involves collaborating with it, bringing it to life in your imagination, mm -hmm. I think is the, it describes the absolute essence of that activity. Mm -hmm. And it's the reason that no matter how many people, let's say it's a Harry Potter book and every person on a whole train of the, oh, you know, of the subway, you turn and everyone's reading the same book right. you're, you're reading and maybe they're on the same page. Right. It's still not as though you're in a movie theater watching a screen together. And one of my unusual experiences as a writer is that in talking about my work with readers and talking about my process and the kind of conversation we're having, but not, not always at this level, partly I think because the fact of my art training is, is out there, people will sometimes take that cue and praise my work for its visual component. That's they say, you write like a painter, you write, you write, you evoke such remarkable visual experiences. And I've always been struck by that remark because I don't think it's wrong, but I do think it's a misunderstanding because I think if you analyze my work, it's actually under-described. I'm very, very stinting, for the most part, with the kinds of specific dis descriptions of what a room looks like, what someone's clothing or hair or face looks like, that people believe they, they go to fiction to receive. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I know this because I've had illustrators, people trying to do jack art. I have no idea what the room looks like. Saying, you know, it was so what confusing to me. Hair? I checked the whole book and I can't tell what color her hair is. And this is the main character of the book. And I'll, and I'll say to them, no, I know that I never said. Yeah. Because I, I have a, a abhorrence. For me, visual description was what I always skipped mm -hmm. when I was a reader. So That's I have a, a it, it, there's something prosaic about or banal about literal visual language and so I tend to withhold it in favor of conversation mm -hmm. 
and metaphorical or interior mm -hmm. language. So I knew that in one sense these people were dead wrong, that I was actually a, a, a less than visual writer. Mm -hmm. But what struck me was that what they meant was that something about the kinds of conceptual descriptions I offer them force them to activate mm -hmm. their visual cortex. Mm -hmm. They begin doing a lot of visualization mm -hmm. because of what I do and don't put in. Right. Much as your language in, in that book, mm -hmm. uh, even a part, of course, from the, the graphics, which sometimes helped and sometimes didn't help right. me, was a constant trigger to, it was, you know, it was as though I was walking through a museum full of insane, unprecedented, abstract art that was blowing my mind because you were activating my visual, the necessity of my visualization by the kind of work you were doing. Even mathematically, it's an interesting question, how much should a, a, a math, mathematician or physicist visualize? And how much is it an actual weakness to be literally visualizing? If I'm doing something in uh, five dimensions instead of three, it's something I literally can't visualize. But I find myself always trying to make that map two, three, what can I see, literally see, that will give me some feeling of you know, comfort or, or some sense of intuition, even though I know that I can't see the whole five-dimensional space. There is no way for me to simultaneously visualize the whole five-dimensional space. And at the end of the day, I'm going to be writing, you know, homotopy group of gamma equals, you know, it's going to be written in pure math code, but at mm -hmm. least I, I feel something I can hang on to. Not everybody is like that. Some people um, are, will not visualize or don't like to visualize at all. And I find I draw a lot in, with, in relation to doing my work. In, they're totally uh, schematic drawings and usually scientifically contentless, but somehow still critical for me to understand exactly what's going on. I have to have that drawing. I love that combination of words, scientifically contentless. <laughs> right.